There are many ways to communicate the threats of climate change, but not everyone will listen to the scientists. So the Climate Science Breakthrough theme, team decided to pair um, world-renowned scientists with famous comedians. And just before COP28 in Dubai, they released this video of Joe Brand translating UCL's very own Professor Mark Maslin. Let's have a look and see what you think. Hiya. I don't even know what your job title means. Hi, I'm Mark Mazin, and I'm a professor of Earth System Science at University College London. Hi, I'm Joe Brand, comedian, and if people like me have to get involved, you know we're in deep shit. The climate crisis is progressing much faster than anticipated. Our models projected that we would cross the dangerous 1.5 degree threshold in the 2030s or even the 2040s. But at this rate, we're going to breach it within only a few years. Translation. We're still going to hell, but we're getting there faster. We are destabilizing our planet's climate system, which is already leading to an increase in unpredictable weather events. Potentially everyone everywhere now faces a direct threat to their way of life. Your house is on fire, but don't worry, the next flash flood should sort it out. We are heading for unknown territory if we trigger tipping points irreversible thresholds which shift our entire ecosystem into a different state. If you like climate crisis, you're going to love climate complete fucking collapse. The overall consequences are literally inescapable. Crop failures, global food shortages, hundreds of millions of refugees. Our complex societies are at genuine risk of collapse. I'm sure in a society where people lose their shit if their delivery orders five minutes late, we will cope magnificently with global food shortages. The irony is solar and wind power are now over 10 times cheaper than oil and gas. We can still prevent much of the damage and end up in a better place for everyone. With wind and sun power, we save money and don't die. It's a pretty strong selling point. Most people actually are in favour of urgent action. The reason governments are not transitioning fast enough is because the fossil fuel industry has a grip on many politicians. In fact, governments subsidise them with our taxpayers' money over $1 trillion a year, according to the IMF. We are paying a bunch of rich dudes $1 trillion a year to fuck up our future. I'd do it for that money. When can I start? We all need to show up now before more irreversible damage is done. Start by speaking up against new oil and gas licensing, which is the last thing we need. Protesting doesn't work, except for the suffragettes and civil rights and gay rights and the right to weekends, I think. So let's go, boys and girls. What did you think of my translation? I thought it was great. How bad is it really? I mean, that you would never tell me this, but are, are people exaggerating it a bit to make it seem worse than it is? We don't exaggerate. We don't need to. London, OK? We hit 40 degrees in July. So that heat wave was 16 degrees warmer than it should have been. So I would say most scientists are incredibly concerned and many of them actually suffer from climate anxiety, just like normal people do. OK. How do you think this is all going to end? Things are moving. I know this sounds really strange when it's all doom and gloom, but the amount of solar and wind is exponential in its growth. We are, the whole economy is changing. China plants more wind turbines than the rest of the world put together. So there's lots of positive things. There's a brilliant book by Simon Sharp who says, we're doing great stuff, but we have to do everything, and I mean everything, five times faster. I've read that. I haven't really. It's a brilliant piece of communication. It is my pleasure to once again welcome Professor Mark Maslin, one half of the Dynamic Duo. Mm. 
First of all, many congratulations on this fantastic video. I noticed that you are not wearing the same jacket, but you were told to wear the same outfit. Yeah, I, I was told to wear the same outfit, but I thought it would be a bit strange coming straight from the video onto the stage. No, you can do that in Hollywood, but not here. Oh, and by the way, I have to say this is really strange because sort of like we're sitting side by side, a little bit like at home where sort of like I'm just turning on the TV, watching Netflix or some other high quality subscription channel. So, but we've got hundreds of people watching us and online as well. So, yeah, Sugar, ask a question quick. <laughs> Um, so we're going to uh, jump into the real questions now. Uh, why do you think it is important that scientists get involved in these sorts of projects? So for me, the important thing is that all of us in this room know about climate change. We all worry about it. It's something that actually fuels perhaps our activism or our business or our academic work. However, when you move outside and talk to normal people, they have such busy lives. They have complicated lives. Desperately trying to get their kids to school on time. They're trying to actually sort of like put food on the table. They're trying to actually pay their bills. And then we say, oh, excuse me, um, I'm really sorry, I'm a scientist. Could you now worry about the end of the world? It doesn't really go down very well. And so therefore, translation. So making it humorous, using somebody that somebody loves like Joe Brand really works to get to an audience that I can never get to. And I think that's really important, and it's really weird. I was on breakfast TV, which is the weirdest thing on the planet, by the way, and sort of like, I was with Richard, and sort of like, I was asked this question, it's like, uh, sort of like, oh, so why did you do this with Joe Byrne? I went, because it got me on breakfast TV. I said, you'd never have me on there talking about climate change and things like that. I said, but you've got Joe Brand, and everybody loves Joe Brand, so that's why. And they, they literally went, oh, yeah. So yeah, that's why I do it. <laughs> I know that I should be asking you a question about climate change, but I have a feeling that uh, we've already done that all morning. So um, I'm going to ask you a more important question, which is, what was it like to work with Joe Brand? Oh, she's brilliant. Uh, I have to say, uh, it was a very odd situation, because you, you're in this sort of slight TV studio, you're sort of like... I'm looking in that direction and she's looking in that direction and we're sort of like having these sideward glances. But we come from a very similar background. We sort of like, we have family that worked uh, in the NHS, she works in the NHS and we have that sort of like London background. And so we bonded and as you probably know, the media, the media is very well to do on occasion. So of course there was us forming this little clique. And you'll see that in the videos, that we actually have a little bit of a bond and uh, we were making jokes. Uh, the problem is that you'll notice that me here is very different to me on the video. Oh, the director, Mark, less emphasis, more boring. It's like, and I literally, about the fifth time, it's like, yes, we are all going to die horribly. It's like, because that's what people think scientists should be like. Well, um, as a person in media, I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> uh, moving on to the next question. I noticed that Joe Brand um, uses swearing for emphasis. So do you think that the climate crisis now is so bad that the scientists should be officially allowed to swear? Ooh, that's a difficult one. It's interesting because Joe also asked me this, so not as if I prepared this earlier, but... Do you think things are so um, serious that, that scientists should be allowed to swear? <laughs> what do you mean, like, say... No, oh. I mean in public, like when they're giving some sort of, like, report on, on the climate. No. Would... Okay. No, the reason being I is <laughs> I know you do, and I love it when you do. I, I think it's it's really empowering when you do. It's a really interesting game as a scientist. We're taken seriously by the public because we're calm, because we're rational, and we have to pretend to be the scientist that they have in their imagination. So as soon as the scientist starts to be sweary or a bit hysterical or a bit sort of like oh, end of the earth, etc., they stop taking us seriously. And yeah. so we all realise that we have to tone it down. We just have to be, yes, it is really bad, but there are things we can do. Not <gasps> <that's really> Exactly. <laughs> but you 
you and comedians and people that communicate incredibly well with the public, you can scream and shout and say fuck as much as you like. Please do. Because it okay. is that sort of, I want to tear my hair out. <laughs> Thank you. And, and I really do mean that. As scientists, we have that role is to try and communicate evidence, can communicate impact, communicate how bad it is. But we're not allowed to get hysterical, even though you know deep inside, whenever you see me on the media, I'm going, ah! Okay, but I'm not allowed to do that because it then loses that. Now, this is why we have this wonderful ecology. You have scientists giving the facts. You have incredible activists basically doing that bit, which uh, raising the emotions of people, etc. You have politicians going, well, okay, we're going to try and fix it. And I love the previous panel. Absolutely brilliant. Mark, I have another question for you. Apart from publishing a lot of scientific papers, 200 papers, I think, at last count. Um, you also do a lot of science communication from books and articles, but also a lot of media. For instance, the um, David Attenborough's Climate Change, The Fact, mm -hmm. um, the first ever climate change documentary in Farsi. Oh, I'm sorry, who Operation. directed that? Oh, I don't know. Oh, well, that was you. OK, right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So, uh, do you have any advice um, for younger colleagues wanting to get involved uh, in communicating their science? Because I think we need that, don't you think? Oh, no, we do. Absolutely. And one of my roles as PVP in UCL is to try to grab those incredible young dynamic academics and make sure that they're engaging so we have a much more diverse sort of set of voices from academia giving that sort of like wisdom to sort of like the media and to the public. But it comes down to a few things. I mean, the first thing I would say always is only do it if you feel you want to. I think this is really important. Don't allow people to force you to do it because remember that isn't necessarily your day job. And trust me, if you're doing media and communication, your university isn't really going to thank you for it because that's not your day job. It's something you do as an extra. So that's the first thing. The second thing I always say is always stick to your expertise. Okay? So if you have a particular field of research, speak to that because the public can smell a fraud or when you're sort of like straying into a field you, have, you really don't know about. They can feel that. So stick to that. That also gives you confidence because you understand it. I also think that you need to think about ways of communicating because the media landscape is huge. You can do a 30-second segment on the news or you can write a wonderful blog or article that actually then goes and gets read by hundreds of thousands of people. So lots of different ecology. And the other thing also is ask advice. For me, one of the most amazing things about being allowed to look after the academics going to COP26 in Glasgow, it's a big push that we had for that, is that UCL beautifully and very kindly sat down with all of us and gave us some media training. And that allowed people, academics that normally would go, ooh, I'm not touching the media, you know, they'd be scary. And they are. But they then realized that actually most of the media just want some answers. They just want a soundbite. They just need something like that. And that training, I always say, you are never too old to learn more and more, particularly when you're engaging with them. And my last one is, if you're doing it as a long-term part of your career, build up those networks, OK? These journalists will be your friends, okay? There are people that are literally going to phone you and go, Mark, I'm desperate, I've got a deadline. Just give me a quote, okay? That's what you do. You build up an ecology, okay? They are part of your team, and they are going to be your friends for a long time. And I think it's also important to note um, all the misinformation and disinformation at the moment on social media. And so, in my opinion, we need the scientists to be active on these platforms and uh, just convey uh, the correct facts that people um, are supposed to know. Well, I don't know if you've ever been involved in uh, all these, like, 
scary conversations <laughs> on Instagram, Twitter. And so you always need a scientist to come in and tell them, yeah. don't read everything, don't believe everything you read on social media. They're not true. And the nice thing is that you know that I have. I mean, again, the other piece of advice which you must take away from this is if you're active on social media and Twitter now X is a cesspit, okay? Or if you're on Instagram or if you're on Facebook or any of the other social media platforms or you write an article for The Guardian or something like, do not read the comments. <laughs> Okay, no, I'm being serious. This is good for your personal health, okay? Because, one, most of them will be written by bots. So you're going to get angry at an AI machine that's just insulting you. Two, some of them are just written to try and actually waste your time and get you upset. Now, on most of the social media, there are wonderful things like hide, block, hide, block. And that's all I spend. I, I mean, I spend more time hiding and blocking than I do posting. And again, that's important. But... I'll go back to what Shuka said. We have to be in that space as activists, as scientists, as concerned citizens, because we cannot allow that space to be taken over by the bots and the fossil fuel lobbyists. Okay? So I really passionately believe that, but don't read the comments. <laughs> Professor <laughs> Maslin, thank you. Any last word of advice? for our beautiful audience here and those who are with us online? Advice. The world is getting better. I know that sounds very strange, okay? But one of the things we cannot give in to is that view of a catastrophic future, that doomism, okay? So I and many other of my colleagues, like Catherine Hayhoe, um, sort of like Michael Mann, we're all on social media and we push back against the deniers, okay? We fight them with the sword of righteousness, but we also push back against the, oh, let's give up, we're doomed, it's all awful. No, we're humanity, okay? We are the most innovative species that's ever existed, okay? We have all the solutions. And I think the biggest problem that I have is we have all those solutions, and also we're humans. So therefore, unlike, say, a meteorite impact or plate tectonics, we can change our impact. We can reduce it. We can actually repair. If we decide to plant a trillion trees, we can plant a trillion trees. If we decide to actually suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere, we can. We have a hundred trillion dollars that we make every single year in the global economy. If we decide to do that, we can. There is nothing holding us back apart from our political system. And at that point, I probably will now leave. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Martin.